We talked last week about four roads, four paths of interpretation through the book of Revelation. You remember that if we are to take the futurist path, we are to see everything from Revelation 4.1 to the end of the book as not having happened yet. And a futurist path will allow us to take at face value the things that the book of Revelation says. The historicist path would see the book of Revelation detailing the things that have happened throughout church history, identifying church historical moments with the details of Revelation. The idealist path would see there's no details to see here, but just the general idea of the war, of the cosmic realities between good and evil, God and Satan, and sort of a general idea of that battle. And then the preterist view, which saw all of the events of the book of Revelation having already happened either in A.D. 70 or about the early 4th century. Uh, We have taken the futurist path And we can't walk down four roads that diverged in the middle of the the woods all at the same time. Uh, In order to think about a futurist interpretation of the book of Revelation, that will bring us face to face with what we view about the kingdom. The kingdom of God. And if you read your Bibles and, and you look for the theology of the kingdom, you will find several facets. God is king. He's sovereign over all things all the time. He is always king and always has been king. There was no need for that aspect of the kingdom to emerge. It has always been and will always be. Secondly, God is sovereign in the hearts of his people. Anyone in any age who has subjected himself by faith to the God of the Bible has God seated on the throne of his heart. But there is another aspect of the kingdom to which the Bible testifies, and it is the earthly kingdom of Messiah. And so, what we believe about the kingdom has a symbiotic relationship with the path we take in interpreting the book of Revelation. If you are a futurist, you will be pre-mill, and if you're pre-mill, you will be a futurist. Uh, We are both of those things, and they go together. Let's start with some definitions. Millennium. Millennium means a thousand. And I will pull from Merriam Webster's online dictionary. Definition number one of a millennium is the, here's Webster's definition. Number one, letter A. The thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20, during which holiness is to prevail and Christ is to reign on the earth. That's number one definition in Webster, just in case you wanted to know. That may make you want to read dictionaries for fun. I like it. Second definition is a period of great happiness or human perfection. A third definition just is a period of a thousand years. Now, we talk about we just entered the third millennium. What we mean by that is we've entered into the third thousand year period. Or a millennium can mean the thousandth anniversary. Uh, Example given in Webster is in 2015, the city of Leipzig, Germany celebrated its millennium. Okay, so we understand that's the way Webster defines a millennium, a period of a thousand years, or in definition, uh, number one letter B, a period of great happiness. And when we look at systems of thinking about when does the kingdom happen, we have pre-mill, ah-mill, and post-mill. And I'm going to use those labels instead of spelling out the tongue-twisting premillennialism and trying to say that all day today. So pre-mill is premillennialism. And by pre-mill, we simply mean the kingdom will come when Christ returns. In other words, Christ returns pre-millennium. There's a thousand year period of Christ's reign on the earth and he comes to the earth before that kingdom. That's the pre-mill view. Amill is short for amillennialism. Did I put it, which order did I put him in? Post-mill? No, amill's next. Amill is short for amillennialism. And, and we put the little A in front of a word, it means not, right? If you say someone is amoral, they're, they're not moral. If you talk about amusement, to muse means to think. It means you're not thinking. You go to an amusement park, check your brain at the door. Um, amillennial sounds like, well, there, there's no millennium whatsoever. That's probably not fair to the amillennial position. 
They're, they're not saying that nothing good is happening. There's no such kingdom to think about. No, the amillennial position specifically believes that there is no future earthly kingdom to look forward to. Uh, that is, the, the, the kingdom reign of Christ is now already. And, and various amill positions would talk about that kingdom reign of Christ in the heart of believers or in the, in the reality of heaven with the saints who have already gone to heaven or a combination thereof. Uh, but there's no literal future thousand year reign or earthly kingdom to look forward to. In fact, the eschatology or the end times plan of amillennialism is Christ returns and that's it. We enter the new heavens and new earth, the eternal state. Post mill is like it sounds. The, the millennium happens first and then Christ returns. And the idea there is that Christians are to be about building the kingdom before Christ's return. Uh, that is, the church establishes Christ's kingdom on earth to make it a suitable place for Christ to come down and reign. And then the duration of his reign before the eternal state is different uh, interpreter by interpreter. And that uh, establishment of the kingdom in post-mill theologians comes by one of two ways. Either by gospel progress, we preach the gospel and there is a dramatic spiritual revival that reaches to the ends of the earth such that just about everybody believes and then Christ comes. Or secondly, by reconstructionism. That is, Christians get a hold of the reins of power and influence in a good way, uh, by government, by education, by the arts, by culture, and we use those influential places to bring about a Christian culture. Uh, some would take that so far as to institute Mosaic law code as the statutory jurisprudence around the world. Uh, the idea is we set up the kingdom as a suitable place for Christ to come. That's post-mill. There is another view. I don't have it listed for you on the screen. It is pan mill. So you can be pre mill, ah mill, post mill, or pan mill. Pan mill just means it'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> right? And, and, and that can either come from indifference or ignorance. You know, the I, I, don't, I don't know and I don't care. Or, you know, I just haven't studied this out yet. I'm so thankful that Jesus wins. I'm so thankful that God is in charge. I love him. I can't wait to see how it goes down. Um, so, and, and wherever you are on that spectrum, what I hope to do this morning is to help us see what the Bible has to say about Messiah's earthly kingdom. And the Bible has a lot to say. I hope to help you understand why we as a church believe in a future literal reign of Christ on the earth and why, therefore, we will be studying the book of Revelation from a futurist perspective. More personally, I want you to know what you have to look forward to. In the greatest era of human history, and we haven't seen it yet, I want you to know what you as a disciple or a follower or a learner of Jesus Christ have been praying for. If you have prayed like Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come. What is it that you've been praying for? The Bible has a lot to say about that. And then I'll close our time this morning, Lord willing, with some thoughts about how then should we live. You need to understand up front that this is not merely informational. We're going to look at a lot of information this morning. The Bible has a lot to say. But whenever God tells the future, he does so with a purpose for the present. God's predictive prophecies are never barely informational. You need to know some things. Uh, no, they are motivational. You need to live a certain way. And so my hope, my prayer this morning for all of us is that in thinking about Jesus' coming earthly kingdom, we will be motivated in the ways that God has intended us to live now, to live urgently, to live for his glory, to live expectantly, to live obediently. There is a note sheet on the web so if, if you want to look up the sermon for today on the church's webpage and pull up that note sheet, it has the details and all the Bible references I'll refer to and many more Bible references I will not refer to. And if we all do it at the same time, we can crash the server. 
okay? Um, if you'd like to wait and download that later and just listen for now, what I wanna do is help preserve you from having to get physical therapy from trying to write down everything I'll say, okay? Uh, that, that may be counterproductive. So uh, we'll talk about a lot of things this morning and the details are on the note sheets on the web or if you printed them out ahead of time or are looking at them now, you'll see them there. For our outline this morning, I've simply given this heading, what we learn about Messiah's kingdom on earth from, and then we'll look at about 11 categories in the Bible. First of all, John's description. Turn to Revelation 20. What do we learn about Messiah's kingdom on earth from John's description, from John the Revelator? And we see this here in Revelation chapter 20, verses one to six. And, and this is where the study of Revelation goes. We, we'll, we'll talk about this more in detail when we get there. We're gonna make a few short observations. The first thing we understand from John and his description of the coming kingdom comes from the chronology of the book of Revelation itself. Now, we will notice as we go through, there are time stamps there are indicators about when things happen. Over and over again, we'll see John say, and I saw, and then I saw, after these things. And these are helpful indicators that there is a chronology that is developing in the book of Revelation. And the chronology is fairly straightforward. You get the vision of Christ in chapter one, the present state of the churches in chapters two and three, you get a scene in heaven in chapters four and five, and then the tribulation period in six through 18, the return of Christ in 19, the millennial kingdom in chapter 20, and then the eternal state in 21 and 22. It is chronological, and everybody acknowledges from all systems that if you take the revelation chronologically, you will be premillennial. And we take it chronologically, and there are grammatical reasons to do so. So John's own chronology leads one to the conclusion that Jesus comes first and then establishes his kingdom. Revelation 20 comes after Revelation 19. Now look down at Revelation 20. John writes, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded by, because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and with Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Verse seven, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. This is the only place in the Bible that gives the duration of Messiah's earthly kingdom. And it tells us the duration six times in six verses. It is a thousand years. And it's interesting to note during this thousand years, Satan is bound, and we know that is not his present condition. He is a, like a lion roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. He is the God of this world. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. Those are all present realities about Satan. During this period in Revelation 20, he will be bound, unable to deceive the nations. That's significant. That's an era we're not in. A second thing you must notice from John's chronology is that there are two resurrections, both the same word, both speaking about physical resurrection. And the first is the first of its kind. In other words, it's not the, the, the first resurrection that's ever happened, but it's the first kind of resurrection. And then you have a thousand years, and then the second kind of resurrection. That second resurrection is a resurrection of the dead unto judgment that will take place in Revelation 20 in the second half. In other words, there are physical resurrections on either side of this thousand year period for believers, specifically here for tribulation martyrs. And so you can't place the kingdom in the present age unless you do something totally different with these two physical resurrections. They are bookends to this event that lasts for a thousand years. 
That's what we learn from John's description. And I know there's a, a debate about whether we should take John's description at face value, if we should pay attention to his details. But at least we start with observing what his details are. Secondly, we need to look at Daniel's vision. Daniel's vision. And I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 2. If you were here on Sunday nights when we did a verse-by-verse study through the book of Daniel, you will already recognize that Daniel is the Old Testament's revelation. It lays the foundation and the framework for understanding the book of Revelation. In fact, I don't believe we can understand the book of Revelation without understanding the prophecies of Daniel. Uh, The book of Revelation is wholly dependent on the Old Testament and in some very particular ways, dependent on the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and you'll remember the the, the four-tiered or really five-tiered statue uh, descending order of precious metals down to iron, down to the toes of the statue were iron mixed with clay. The punchline comes in verses 44 and 45 of Daniel chapter 2. Here Daniel is giving the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. What is this statue all about? In the days of those kings, that is the the ten kings, the the ten kingdom manifold uh, empire that makes up the clay iron mixture at the bottom of the statue. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms and it itself will endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. What do we learn from Nebuchadnezzar's statue about Messiah's earthly kingdom? I'll give you eight principles or descriptions of human history that we learn from this dream. Number one, Messiah's kingdom will arrive at the last stage of human history. Verse 44 tells us, in the days of those kings, meaning in the days of the tenfold kingdom at the bottom of the statue. Uh, That is not Babylon, it is not the Persians, it is not the Greeks, it is not the Roman Empire, the solid iron section of the statue that was present in the first day, the empire that crucified Messiah. No, it is in Rome 2.0, a revived Roman Empire of the iron clay mixture and a 10 king empire. It has never yet happened. It is still in the future and Messiah's kingdom comes when that empire is on the world stage. Secondly, we learn that the kingdom will be established directly by God. It's a stone cut out without hands in verse 44. The God of heaven does this. Men do not bring this about. This is not something established by people on the earth. This is totally of God, comes from outside of here, comes to the toes and smashes them. Thirdly, we learn that this kingdom of Messiah will not self-destruct. It will never be destroyed. It will never wane. Um, It will endure forever. Number four, we learned that this kingdom will never have a successor. No rivals, no replacements, nothing will come after this kingdom. And in Daniel's day, it was significant because the, on the horizon of the Babylonian Empire loomed the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and then some other distant version of the Roman Empire. This will be the end of all of those. Number five, this kingdom terminates all sinful human governance. Verse 44 tells us it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. Literally, cause them to be shattered. Sixth, we learn this kingdom will have no end. Uh, It will go forever. Uh, This is significant when we think about Messiah's kingdom. What comes after the millennial reign of Christ? According to Revelation 20, Revelation 21, and a new heavens and new earth. In other words, the government will be on his shoulders and his kingdom will have no end. Messiah's earthly reign ushers in the eternal state. That's exactly what Daniel says as well. Number seven, this will be Messiah's kingdom, verse 45. He is the one cut out, the the stone that the builders rejected and the stone cut out without hands sent by God. He is a striking stone, Isaiah 8, 14, and a stumbling stone, Isaiah 28, 16. He is Zion's chief cornerstone. 
The builders would reject it, Psalm 118. He will be a rock of offense, Romans 9.33. He is the foundation stone, 1 Corinthians 3. And 1 Peter 2 says he is the precious choice cornerstone. And then eighthly, finally from Daniel 2, this kingdom will be cataclysmically victorious. We see that in verse 45. Uh, That which is cut out without hands comes down and smashes. And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that stone turns the entire statue to powder or it is blown to the wind into the sea to be nothing. What does this mean? When Jesus' kingdom comes, everybody will know that it's here. All human government will go away except for the perfect human government of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the earth. Verse 35 of Daniel 2 says, it will fill the whole earth. This will be a world-embracing, universal, indestructible, and everlasting kingdom of Messiah. That is what we learn from Daniel's vision. By the way, the first coming of Christ isn't symbolized in that dream. Now Daniel will get to that in Daniel chapter 9. He'll talk about the first coming of Christ. In fact, he'll nail the arrival of Christ in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem down to the very day in his predictive prophecy. But in the Daniel 2 statue, he is only portraying the earthly reign of Christ as conquering king come to obliterate all human governments. Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream matches what Revelation says about the timing Thirdly, we discover something about Messiah's kingdom from the king's chronology. That is, the order of events of Christ's return portrayed throughout Scripture. Uh, Daniel 2 that we just looked at has the stone arriving and then filling the earth. Right? Not the other way around. Isaiah 64, turn there for a moment if you will. In a few moments, we'll be flipping to many passages. So this is preparation here. Isaiah 64, 1. Here's the prophet's prayer. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence. Did you notice the order? Come down and then make the nations tremble. There is a coming first and a reigning second. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, 5 gives us the arrival and then Zechariah 14, 9, the rain. Uh, we can look at Zechariah 14, 4. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. So the half of the mountain will move toward the north, the other to the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. That is the language of Revelation 19. And then look at verse 9. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. Again, what's the order of events? The arrival and then the reign. Same thing's true of Matthew 24, the arrival of Jesus Christ as his return, and Matthew 25, the reign of Jesus Christ at his return. And the same thing's true in Revelation. His arrival in chapter 19, his reign in chapter 20. That is the consistent pattern in Scripture. A fourth category, what do we learn about Messiah's earthly reign from the prophet's gap? From the prophet's gap. And what I mean by that is Old Testament prophets Uh, would portray events, sometimes very close together, that look like consecutive or even contemporary events, but there was actually space between them. 
And this is very important for us to recognize. And, and it's very helpful that there is, we can see the space between Christ's first coming and second coming. We're living in that space. We've only ever known that space. The, the first coming of Christ is past tense for us. The return of Christ is future. And we're living in the valley between. But in the Old Testament, the first and second coming of Christ are often portrayed like a mountain range where you can't see the valley in between. It's helpful to remember that the millennial kingdom and the eternal state are often portrayed in that same prophetic way where we don't necessarily see the gap. But when you get there, you'll see the gap. Let's look at just a couple examples. If you're in Zechariah, let's, um, let's look at that one first. Zechariah 9 And, and you can write in your Bible, if you're a writer in your Bible, uh, you can just jot down John 12, 15, next to Zechariah 9. In Zechariah 9, 9, we get this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's just, he's endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And, and you know the scene. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9 is fulfilled. John 12, 15 quotes it. John 12, 15 stops where verse 9 of Zechariah 9 stops. But let's keep reading in Zechariah. Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 10 is an event that has not happened that is waiting for his second coming. And you see verse 9 describes first advent, verse 10 describes second advent, and so far 2,000 years in between. That's a prophetic gap. Okay, let's look at one more. Turn to Isaiah 61. And you can write down in your margin next to Isaiah 61, Luke 4, 18 and 19. Isaiah 61, 1, great Trinitarian verse here. The spirit of Edonai Yahweh is upon me. And the me there is the servant of Yahweh, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit of Yahweh is upon Jesus because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. Now Jesus in his hometown goes into the synagogue, is handed the Isaiah scroll, turns to this section and reads it and says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. And he stops right there where I just stopped. And he closed the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. And every eye was on him. Of course, they didn't believe in him. They, they wanted him to do the miracles that they heard he was doing elsewhere. And he said, well, there's no faith here. So do you remember when Elijah did miracles for Gentiles? They got really mad. They took him out on a cliff and tried to throw him off the cliff. He evaded their grasp. What's interesting about that scene in Luke 4 is where Jesus stopped Look down at the page. We cut it off in the middle of a verse. Notice the second half of Isaiah 61 too. And the day of vengeance of our God. It's not even a complete sentence. What was the spirit of the Lord Yahweh upon Messiah anointing Jesus to do? To bring good news, to bind up brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, favorable year of Yahweh, and the day of vengeance of our God. And then Isaiah 61 goes on to describe all that will take place in what the Old Testament promises about Messiah's coming kingdom, which includes the destruction of Israel's enemy, the vindication of God's honor, and vengeance against sinners. Well, that's not what Jesus came to do in his first coming. He preached good news. And so he stopped in Isaiah 61, 2a, and he left off 2b. Why? Prophetic gap, at least 2,000 years in between them. He will do the second half of that verse. 
In fact, he says in Luke 11, I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo. He's talking about the immersion under the wrath of God at the cross and how distressed of soul am I until it is accomplished. Jesus came to die. The servant of Yahweh has come to be a suffering servant first and a conquering king second. This matches Jesus' parable. Uh, we won't read it, but in Luke 19, Jesus tells the parable of a king from a far off country who came to secure a kingdom for himself and then he left. And when he comes back, he has expectations about how his servants have behaved. But what have we discovered? Our king came. In fact, when he was here, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near, it's right here. Why was he saying that? Because the king was present. The king is what makes the kingdom. But then he left and he's coming back. That is the prophetic gap. Fifthly, let's look at Messiah's role. Messiah's role. The Old Testament portrayed Messiah as the one who would be suffering servant and conquering king. We need to read J.C. Ryle's Are You Ready for the End of Time? If you don't have that book, you need to get that book. It's available in the uh, book table. J.C. Ryle is fascinating because J.C. Ryle wrote that book in 1867. 1867 is a couple decades ahead of Theodore Herzl's Zionist movement and the official start of the Zionist organization. It was begun in the 1890s. The Zionist organization was an attempt by Jews to regather Jews from all over the world, primarily in Europe, and regather them back in the land of Israel, uh, a land that was populated by Bedouins at the time, and, and for a while nobody laid claim to it except the British. Um, and then the Balfour Declaration was issued not until 1917. The Balfour Declaration was a British movement to say, hey, we need to give these people uh, their land. It is their historical land. Uh, they need a place to live. And Israel's statehood, as you know, came about in 1948. Imagine what it was like to be J.C. Ryle 80 years prior uh, to modern Israel's statehood. There is no Israel. Can't find it on a map. You might have gone along with a lot of the Bible commentators, one of my own heroes, John Owen, uh, who wrote in the 1600s, he wrote a, a, an intense uh, multi-volume commentary on the book of Hebrews, and the first volume and a half deals with the question of Israel, and it's, he sums it up, his position this way, if 1600 years are not enough to prove that God is done with Israel, I don't know what else to say to you. <laughs> and if you think about it, well, maybe, Maybe the church has replaced Israel. Maybe I am Israel. Uh, maybe those are spiritual realities and, and they're about us. And, and J.C. Ryle had the audacity in the 1860s to write a book that said, no, we're gonna believe God's promises. You guys should believe God's promises. Well, a little easier for us since 1948 to say, wait, there actually are Jews still in existence? And and they're making their way back to the land? That's interesting. I, I, guess I, I guess I can believe that. To believe that when there was no geography and no geopolitics surrounding a modern state of Israel uh, was truly an act of faith in the promises of God. I would commend to you J.C. Rowell's book, Are You Ready for the End of Time? But when we think about Messiah's role from the Old Testament, uh, we need to think about places like Psalm 2. Uh, all the Jews believe this was a messianic psalm. We believe this is a messianic psalm. Um, what is Messiah to do? This from the pen of David. Why are the nations in an uproar? The song begins. And the peoples devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against Yahweh, against his anointed a reference to Messiah, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. And he who sits in the heavens laughs, he scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger, terrify them in his fury. As for me, I install my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will tell of the decree of Yahweh. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me, I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth your possession. You shall rule them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. 
Take warnings, O judges of the earth. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. What is the Old Testament hope for Messiah? Conquering king. Psalm 110, same thing. Conquering king. Uh, The expectation is all over the Old Testament. And the reality is, Jesus is king. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He has the right to rule. And it is appropriate for Jesus as rightful king to actually possess his inheritance. To actually live on the earth. To rule as the Bible said he would. We ought to want that for our Savior. We, we think of Christ as suffering servant. We think of the one who died on the cross for our sins, and rightly so. We dare not lose sight of his role as king. There is a, an aspect to the, to the very nature of humanity bound up in this. In Genesis 2, man was created as God's subregion on the earth, made in his image to rule. Psalm 8 is a commentary on that. Um, man for a little while lower than the angels, but it's incredible what God has done. And then Hebrews 2 tells us that mankind isn't living up to that yet. We don't see him with everything under his feet yet. But Christ, and think about what Christ is. Jesus the Christ is a man who, according to Colossians 1, is said to be the image of God. You want to know what the image of God in man is? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the image of God as a man. And he will rule on the earth. His saints who are with him will rule with them. This is appropriate for Christ to do. These were the messianic expectations of the Old Testament. By the way, the messianic expectations of the Old Testament were never corrected in Christ's ministry, never corrected in the New Testament, never corrected in the first three centuries of church history. It did become difficult during church history for Christians to answer the questions of the Jews. If if you say that Jesus truly is Messiah then where's Messiah's reign? That was the Jewish perspective. And as sort of an apologetic response to that, some theologian said, hey, yeah, you know what? Uh, You're thinking of an earthly reign. Let's rethink that. But that was a response to a Jewish protest. We ought rather to embrace the messianic expectations of those who read their Old Testaments. Suffering servant and a conquering king. Charles Spurgeon, in his uh, late-in-life sermon on the millennial reign of Christ, said this, Brothers, no truth ought to be more frequently proclaimed next to the first coming of the Lord than his second coming. And you cannot thoroughly set forth all the ends and bearings of the first advent if you forget the second. If he came to die, doubt not that he will come to reign. If he came to be despised and rejected of men, why should we doubt that he will come to be admired in all them that believe? This leads us to a sixth line of evidence. What do we learn about Messiah's earthly reign from God's promises? Well, we learn that God made promises regarding both the reign of Messiah and the sufferings of Messiah. And what did we find out when Christ came? The first advent promises were fulfilled literally. They were fulfilled literally. And you can trace the prophecies of Jesus coming and trace their fulfillment in his first coming, and they happened as the Old Testament said they would. Born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. None of those things are spiritualized or idealized. They were literal historical events that happened as the prophet said. What ought we to do with the same prophets speaking in the same passages about his second coming? I think we ought to have a literal expectation of them as well. J.C. Ryle says this, quote, it is high time for Christians to interpret unfulfilled prophecy by the light of prophecies already fulfilled. The curses on the Jews were brought to pass literally, so will be the blessings. The scattering was literal, so will be the gathering. The pulling down of Zion was literal, so will be the building up. The rejection of Israel was literal, so also will be the restoration. It is high time to interpret the events that shall accompany Christ's second advent by the light of the accompanying of the first advent. The first advent was literal, visible, personal, so will be the second. His first advent was with a literal body, so will be his second. At his first advent, the least predictions were fulfilled to the very letter, so also will they be at his second. 
the first was literal and physical, so will be the glorious second. Ryle goes on to say, suppose a Jew asks you, do you believe the Old Testament? This is significant. Being in Israel, just wondering, uh, what what if I was here and and I thought, no, Israel's not Israel, the land's not the land. Uh, How am I supposed to have people read their Bibles and turn to Isaiah 53 and take that part literally? That is a problem. Here's what J.C. Ryle says. Will you dare to tell the Jew that Old Testament prophecies of this kind are not to be taken in their plain literal sense? Will you dare tell him that the words Zion, Jerusalem, Jacob, Judah, Ephraim, Israel do not mean what they seem to mean, but instead mean the church of Christ? Will you dare to tell him that the glorious kingdom and future blessedness of Zion so often dealt upon in prophecy mean nothing more than gradual Christianizing of the world by missionaries and gospel preaching? Will you dare to tell him that you think it carnal to take scriptures literally? Carnal to expect a literal rebuilding of Jerusalem. Carnal to expect a literal coming of Messiah to reign. Carnal to look for literal gathering and restoration of Israel. O reader, if you are a man of this mind, take care what you are doing. I think J.C. Ryle is right. The messianic expectation of the Jews and the disciples under Jesus' ministry, they did get some things wrong. But their wrongness was not in a total missing of Scripture, but a clinging to half. Oh, they understood Psalm 97 and 98, the glorious reign of Messiah on the earth, but they missed Psalm 22, suffering a Messiah on a cross. They got Isaiah 11 and the glories of a prosperous blessing in the land, but they did not get Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant crushed by his father. They understood crown, glory, restoration, blessing, but not suffering, humiliation, and substitution. They were not wrong in expecting Messiah to reign. But they did not like the idea of him coming to suffer. Now what about us? We might be guilty of the opposite emphasis. Again, this is J.C. Ryle. If the Jew thought too exclusively of Christ reigning, has not the Gentile thought too exclusively of Christ suffering? If the Jew could see nothing in the Old Testament prophecy but Christ's exaltation and final power, has not the Gentile often seen nothing but Christ's humiliation in the preaching of the gospel? If the Jew dwelt too much on Christ's second advent, has not the Gentile dwelt too exclusively on the first If the Jew ignored the cross, has not the Gentile ignored the crown? Number seven, let's look at the covenant's fulfillment. Covenant's plural. Uh, The covenants of your Bible, uh, Noah, priestly, Mosaic, Abrahamic, Davidic, and new. We're gonna look at three of those. We're gonna look at primarily the three unconditional covenants that telescope out of the Abrahamic covenant. Covenant is a promise. God made unilateral, unconditional promises to people. It began in Genesis 12. He called Abram out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And he said, Abram, you're gonna be mine. And I'm gonna proceed from you. I'm gonna make you a father of many nations. You're going to have seed or descendants you're going to have land and you're going to have a blessing and you're going to be a blessing to all the nations. All that is bound up in Genesis 12 and the first relational covenant. People, blessing, land. And I want you to see in Genesis 17 where this gets restated, several restatements of the Abrahamic covenant. But in Genesis 17, God makes clear that this is inviolable that is everlasting, look at verse seven. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. This is grace and it's a grace promise from God that can't be changed. It goes forever. If you move to the next covenant, we learn in 2 Samuel 7 that God made promises to David. And really, this Davidic covenant flows out of the Abrahamic covenant. David is, of course, a genetic descendant of Abraham. He is of the tribe of Judah. He is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. 
And God narrows the focus of his covenant promises here in 2 Samuel 7. Look at verse 12. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed, there's that critical word again, after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Again, perpetual grace promise, inviolable, unchangeable. Now, in this Davidic promise, there are conditional realities. If you read further, God says to David, if your son sins, he'll be disciplined. You're like, wait a second, it can't be Jesus. Jesus never sinned. David had seed, had a son who did sin. What do we think of when we get to Solomon? Oh, it's not him. There must be more seed. Just like when Eve was promised seed that would crush the head of the snake. It wasn't Cain, it wasn't Abel, it wasn't Seth, it wasn't Noah, it wasn't any of those people. We're still waiting for somebody. We are still waiting for an Abrahamic line, a Davidic line, seed, who will fulfill these promises. And when they are fulfilled, it is an unconditional covenant, inviolable, unchangeable, in perpetuity. Look at Psalm 89. Just to sort of get an exclamation point on God's view of the Davidic covenant. And there are several Psalms that speak this way. Verse 30 says, if his sons forsake my law, did they? Did David's sons forsake God's law? Yes. If they violate my statutes, then I will punish their transgression with the rod. Verse 33, but I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. Do you understand God's integrity is at stake in the keeping of his promises? My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. No disobedience undoes the Davidic covenant any more than any disobedience undoes the Abrahamic covenant. Let's look at the new covenant. I'll just refer you, you can write down Deuteronomy 30, Ezekiel 36 and 37, Jeremiah 31. Uh, There are about a dozen new covenant passages in the Old Testament that promise for Israel, in Deuteronomy 30, it's circumcision of heart. In Ezekiel, it's described of removing the heart of stone and replacing with a heart of flesh. In Jeremiah 31, it's described as having a new heart. And each time these promises are given, it is a promise for spiritual renewal of Israel, ethnic Israel, and a promise of blessing in the land. These new covenant promises are never separated. Um, You you don't get new hearts in the Old Testament in new covenant promise without attachment to blessing in the land. Look at every single passage, you see the same pattern. Turn to Jeremiah 31. This is the classic text on the new covenant. Behold, days are coming, Jeremiah 31, 31, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant, notice this, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What does that mean? House of Israel and Judah together. At the point that Jeremiah is writing this, they're divided. This still awaits a reunification of the 12 tribes under one king in the land. It's never yet happened. God's gonna make this new covenant. It's not like the Mosaic covenant, verse 32, they broke that. But this covenant, verse 33, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh, I will put my law within them, on their heart I'll write it, I will be their God and they will be my people. Nobody has to teach about Yahweh, they'll all know me, I will forgive their sin, I will remember it no more. Uh, These are staggering promises of spiritual renewal. By the way, 1948 is not a fulfillment of the new covenant, just in case you were wondering. Israel's not repentant. The blessings in the land under a Davidic king do not come just because geopolitics. They will come when God pours out the spirit of grace and supplication, Zechariah 12, and Israel nationally repents and believes the gospel. 
when they look on Jesus whom they crucified and mourn for him as for an only son, when they sing Isaiah 53 as their song of repentance, uh, they don't get the physical benefits of Deuteronomy 28 promises without the spiritual renewal of Deuteronomy 30 circumcision of heart which God promised he would give them. That's the new covenant. I will put my law on their hearts, they'll benefit from it. Now look at this, verse 35. Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon and stars by night, who stirs up the sea, Yahweh of armies is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares Yahweh, then the seed of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says Yahweh, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done. Look, God acknowledges Israel's sin and their rejection of him, and he keeps his promises. Those are bound up in the new covenant. Number eight, the Old Testament's descriptions. I had planned to read one out of 10 Bible verses for each one of these 20 descriptions to you. We don't have time. They're they're in the notes. Um, Read all of these. You need to understand that that what the Old Testament says about Messiah's earthly kingdom is so rich. It takes up so much real estate in your Bible. You can't ignore it. Uh, I'm going to give you summary statements here, and you can do the homework later and, and look at all the verses that I've given you. Here's how the Old Testament describes Messiah's future earthly kingdom. One kingdom on the earth to which all the nations will be obedient. One religion, if we want to call it that. And the religion is Christ. The religion is Messiah. Zechariah 14, 16 talks about every year all the nations of the earth will trek to Jerusalem for a feast. Number three, idolatry will be eradicated on the earth. Number four, Israel will be faithful and devoted to Yahweh. When has that ever happened in history yet? It hasn't. Number five, world peace. Again and again in the refrain of the Old Testament prophets, they will beat their swords into plowshares. What does that mean? All the ingenuity, all the technology, all the genius of man that has been built around killing each other and defending ourselves from being killed by the other guy. All the weapons of war, all the strategies. Imagine if all of that went to productive things. What will the world be like? Right? This is what every beauty pageant contestant hopes for. What do you hope to change in the world? I want world peace. Well, she's not wrong. We all want that. But the beauty pageant's not gonna bring it about. The Camp David Accords are not gonna bring it about. No US president can sit there at the table and get the Middle East peace crisis solved. Somebody will in the future, that's coming. We'll get there in the book of Revelation. Look, only Jesus brings about world peace. And God promises that all those implements of war will be made productive to bring about life and prosperity for the human race. Number six, environmental peace. This is Isaiah 11. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. Uh, The lion will eat straw like the ox. The kid will put his hand in the den of the cobra and not be hurt. Um, What is that? End of animal predation and the end of the curse not quite the end, we'll talk about that, but the amelioration of the curse on the animal world where the environment isn't fighting back against sinful humans. There will be a a, a synchronicity between humans and the animal world that will be a matter of joy. You've always wanted to have a pet leopard, I know. Uh, Maybe swim with great white sharks without a cage. Whatever it is, uh, that environmental peace will be there in the kingdom. Number seven, it will be Edenic, particularly in the land of Israel, but with hints that it will be Edenic the world over. Specifically speaking of the land of Israel, the wilderness will be turned into a lush, vegetated plain. Fresh water everywhere and things growing. Number eight, long life. Isaiah 65 talks about those who make it to 100 years old will be seen as a child. We talk about, oh, he just became a teenager. Uh, Oh, Little Johnny just became a centenarian. He's got a ways to go yet. He's wet behind the ears. Number nine, the 12 tribes will be united under one king. Number 10, Jerusalem will be exalted, and not simply metaphorically, though that's true in the prophets as well, but also topographically, geologically. 
Uh, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 64, Micah 4, 1, again, you can look these up, uh, all depict God leveling mountains, leveling the surrounding hills, and raising up Zion, the, the temple mount, the, the physical topography, so that it is the highest in the area. It's not currently that, God will make it that. I've given you a number of other Bible passages that talk about uh, mountains falling and topography changing at the presence of God when he comes to judge. The Bible's full of this kind of language. It will have a significant impact on Jerusalem itself. Number 11, the city of Jerusalem and the temple will be made beautiful. Uh, by the way, there's no temple in the eternal state. Do you understand that? If we, if we take language at face value, Messiah's earthly reign will have a beautified and protected temple that it has never yet had. And there's no temple in the new heavens and new earth. Right? That's a discontinuity between the kingdom and the eternal state. Number 12, the dispersed Israel will be regathered. Number 13, the Israelites will be honored by the nations. Zechariah 8.33 says, the nations, the Gentiles, will look for a Jew and hang on by the coattails and say, can I go with you to Jerusalem? Uh, that has not been the story of Jews in the 20th century. Uh, it will be true in the kingdom. There will be streams of fresh water from the Temple Mount, number 14, flowing down to the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. Oh, that'll be fascinating to see the Dead Sea turn from a salt brine dead end for life into a thriving, lush place, fresh water. There will be a reduction in the effects of the curse. There will be a new 12 tribe partition of the land, 15 and 16. Number 17, there will be an increase in the beauty and radiance of the sun and the moon. By the way, that's a contrast to the new heavens and the new earth where there is no sun and no moon. Don't need that light. Number 18, there will be restored nations, specifically formerly hostile nations that will become the people of Yahweh, Samaria, Sodom, Gomorrah, Egypt, and Assyria. They will experience political peace and holiness according to the Old Testament prophets loyal to Yahweh. Number 19, Old Testament saints will be resurrected. We looked at this at the end of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verses one and two says there's a resurrection unto life and a re resurrection unto misery and death and judgment and destruction. And at the end of the book of Daniel, the last verse of the book of Daniel, the pre-incarnate Christ tells his prophet Daniel, Daniel, go your way, finish out your prophetic career, and then die, and then rest, and then you will rise again and you will get your allotted portion in the land. This is the promise for Old Testament saints who believed God that they'll actually inherit the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Actually living in the land, in their allotment, according to God's promises. And then finally, number 20, the world will experience Abrahamic blessing. Again, you've got the references in the notes, but it is a fulfillment of Genesis 12. Abraham, God's blessing to Abraham, ends up in a funneling out of blessings to every tongue and tribe and nation and people to be fulfilled in significant way in Messiah's kingdom. Boy, we're out of time. You know, Kyle, you said I couldn't preach long. I'm also singing the song after this, and it's about the, the, the kingdom of Christ. We just go on for a thousand years. Your announcements were really long. I just, you, you just, you told me I was gonna preach a long time. I still have three points. All right, here we go, real fast. The Psalms anticipation. The songs of Israel express hope that does not get met yet. I have Psalms listed for you in the notes. Go read them and look for, hey, when's this gonna happen? The Psalms of Israel, the songs of Israel anticipate Messiah's future reign on the earth. Uh, number 10, the New Testament's witness. Gabriel announced to Mary, Luke 1, 32 and 33. What did she say? Or what did he say to Mary? Um, you're gonna have a son. He will sit on the throne of his father David and will rule over Israel and Judah. Think about that. This is New Testament. If ever there was a time for Gabriel to say, wait a second, I know the Old Testament, physical, literal promises, you need to understand that in a spiritual way now it's the church. He didn't say that. He said, your son will sit on David's throne and will rule over Israel and Judah. That's New Testament. By the way, you trace the throne of David throughout the Bible, every single time it is a real physical ruler on a real throne, a real rulership over Israel and Judah, a united monarchy in the land. That doesn't change when you get the New Testament. Same thing. 
What else do we learn from the New Testament? Uh, the mother of James and John, she wasn't wrong. These were the sons of thunder. Was she thunder or was her husband thunder? I don't know, but she says, hey, uh, Jesus, can my sons sit on your right and your left in the kingdom? Jesus didn't correct her about the kingdom, just about their selfish ambition. Jesus promised to the disciples, Luke 22 and Matthew 19, you will sit at my table and eat and drink with me in the kingdom. He's not talking about heaven because he says you will there also be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Same promises. We see Jesus' clarification to the disciples in Acts 1-6 after the resurrection. Is it now you're gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, you don't have to know the now. You just have to know what your task is. Go preach my death, burial, resurrection, and return. What does Acts portray? They went out, they preached the kingdom, not the kingdom's here. Jesus could say that when he was here. The apostles didn't say that when they scattered to the ends of the earth. In fact, the book of Acts ends with Paul preaching the kingdom, a coming kingdom, and the good news of Jesus crucified in between. Peter's sermon in Acts 3 also looks to the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled, the national identity of Israel enjoying the times of refreshing in Acts 3. Paul's teaching, Romans 11, makes it clear we're in the times of the Gentiles. Israel is partially hardened until all the Gentiles come in that God has appointed. And then Israel will believe and be saved. And of course, all this accords with God's explanation of events in Revelation 20. The New Testament matches the Old Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament is there an alteration, rejection, or nullification of those Old Testament promises. And then number 11 is the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Disciples' Prayer, appropriately. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Pray this way. Your kingdom come. What would that do to us if we prayed that? With, with all of this pile of information we just got and our hearts full of what's it gonna be like when people aren't mocking Christ but they were bowing before Christ? What's it gonna be like when my Savior is vindicated? He's always been king. Some people saw him as a victim. Some people saw him as a joke. I've seen him as my Savior but he will reign on the earth. Boy, can we just look forward to that and say, come Lord Jesus. Hey, can we pray, Lord your kingdom come, your will on earth be done, even as it is done in heaven. That ought to be our prayer. I want you to write down at the bottom of your page, Luke 12, 35 to 48. We don't have time to, to look at it, um, but that is a parable where Jesus gives the expectations for how should we live in light of the fact that he's coming back and we don't know when. You have to understand, Eschatology, the study of the end times, is not mere information. It is always ethical. It always demands a response in the present of how should we live. And according to Jesus' parable in Luke 12, you do not want to be doing things that you would be ashamed of if Christ came back tonight. You don't know when the master of the house is returning. You don't know when the thief is gonna break into your house. How should you live? Be prepared. Jesus says, be dressed in readiness. Be about your master's business. Don't get drunk and beat up the slaves. <laughs> he's coming. And he's coming with his reward. And his reward is, I will be their God and they will be my people. We get to be with him in the greatest era of human history. What we haven't seen yet, what we've all longed for, the reign of Messiah on the earth. And that reign that will never end ultimately will bring in the death of death itself and the eternal state where there is not just an amelioration of the curse, but the end of the curse and life with him forevermore. Let's pray. God, you are king. You are sovereign over all things. You are sovereign over the micro and the macro, every detail of our lives. We think with the psalmist in 139, we, we can go nowhere from your spirit you are everywhere. We can go nowhere from your watchful eye. You, you know everything. But it's not enough just to think that you are aware and that you're present. But that your presence is a sovereign and good one. Evil is on a short leash. Satan is on a short leash. 
geopolitics and world powers and elections and empires and spy balloons, they're all on a short leash. You are in charge, you are king. There is a day coming when you will return, Lord Jesus, to this earth and every eye will behold. And all the sorry views of you will evaporate in a moment. And those who have believed on you and have clung to you in faith will rejoice at your appearing. Oh God, may we be those. And we ask it for your glory in your name. Amen.